This episode is proudly supported by Open Table. Nearly one third of diners are booking same day. So they're making those decisions on the spot. And 10% are, do- are making their bookings within just a few hours. And so it's why it's so important to have you know, booking software like Open Table, which allows your diners to discover you. And so when restaurants are on platforms like Open Table, they're much more likely to be discovered. We help diners to connect to restaurants. Ultimately, having technology, using technology, helps you to reattach to those diners. Experience the power of Open Table. For an exclusive offer, visit restaurant.opentable.com.au forward slash DITW. It's not an implement for cooking exclusively bread or a particular dish, but it's actually something that people are meant to gather around and has always been the case. And I guess in a restaurant context, you you can't really put your customers in that position, but you're, um, you're thinking the same way. Here at Daddy Linen, we love investigating all aspects of the hospitality industry. And there are so many important parts to putting together restaurants, all these sort of hospitality adjacent trades and crafts that go towards creating a restaurant experience. Our guest today is Samuel Ferraccio. He is known as the Brick Chef. He gets around the country installing some of the ovens that create the most delicious food in Australia. Samuel, welcome to Daddy Linen. Thanks for having me, Danny. It's really exciting to have you on the show. We've been chatting about it for a while. Tell us a little bit about your work as the Brick Chef. Uh, well, I guess the easiest way to describe it is I'm a, a stonemason fabricator who works pretty much exclusively in um, hospitality. Um, and I guess the majority of my work is just in wood-fired cooking, so building and uh, designing and consulting for you know wood fired ovens and grills and I guess um, all the problem solving and yeah fun that goes with that. Now, how did you get into that? Like, I mean, how did you get into being a stonemason in the first place? And then how did you move into hospitality? Um, <laughs> without going off on too much of a tangent, it was kind of a family um, business. My dad was a stonemason and an um, alternative builder, and. Um, uh, despite my aesthetic, we're uh, Abruzzese Italian, so we always had uh, wood-fired ovens at home, um, a lot more basic and and um, uh, primitive kind of design. But um, yeah, so so kind of through working in that field in landscaping and building fireplaces and and the odd oven, we started kind of getting more and more um, requests to build those. Um, at the same time, I was kind of working. Um, you know, in cafes kind of on the side and really loved um, kind of having a foot in in hospitality really early on um, because, you know, standing in a paddock by yourself for months on end, you know, putting rocks on top of other rocks isn't the most, um, you know, socially stimulating (laughs) kind of job. Um, But yeah, and then it ended up working for a company that, that designed and built um, ovens and we started moving into the commercial area and, um, that was kind of the point where I wanted to kind of learn more about, um, you know, hospo from a kind of fine dining perspective, uh, and, uh, neighborhood friends, uh, who I'd worked at the, a cafe with, um, asked me to jump on board and, and the guys that own my, um, offered me a job there and were very gracious with my terrible waiting skills and, so I worked there for, you know, a very, very short stint while I was managing uh, this other company's construction arm. Um, and then basically, uh, you know, both of those kind of jobs, uh, you know, ceased and I was out on my own. Um, and uh, that's kind of the, the history of it. I just um, jumped, jumped in head first and left the backyards and padd- paddocks behind and, and traded it for – climbing into live ovens and and roof cavities so (laughs) it sounds yeah it sounds dusty um so in the spirit of digression samuel um with about abruzzese your, your heritage from abruzzo that part of italy um and just can you just talk about some of the styles of um 
wood and charcoal fired cooking in that part of the world? Because it's, I mean, it's something I've only learned a little bit about recently. Um, yeah, by becoming somewhat obsessed with uh, Arostacini. <laughs> That's a, I guess that that's a that is a, a a good little you know um tangent to go on but I guess my experience of it is is very uh anglicized uh, version of that because I guess my um my dad's the first generation born here his dad was a, a POW and they were definitely not uh culinary geniuses <laughs> but um but I guess the style of cooking you know from that region or you know really traditionally wood-fired cooking has always been uh, about the community surrounding that one, you know, oven. Um, and, you know, historically it wasn't like a, every family had this big, you know, unit in their backyard uh, with the, the web of barbecue next to it. It's always um, something that, you know, entire villages would use um, and it would be something that people would gather around and, you um, that's kind of something that's always resonated with me when I go to design is to keep that in mind that it's not an implement for cooking exclusively bread or, you know, a, a particular dish, but it's actually something that people are meant to gather around and has always been the case. And I guess in a restaurant context, you, you can't really put your customers in that position, but you're, um, you're thinking the same way. Well, I think it's, you know, some of the ovens I, that I've seen of yours, there is still a communal sense, like they're they're on show. There's certainly this sense you're not just tasting that sort of um, wood oven experience. You're also sort of in the glow of it to, to some degree. Um, can you talk about the way that you design ovens and how you work with restaurants to um, create something that's, you know, works for them, but also makes sense um, from an engineering point of view? Yeah, that's that's a big um, obstacle for a lot of jobs, I guess, because um, you know that there are always constraints, and um, more and more we're finding that the the engineering side of things and the compliance side of things do dictate a lot of what you can and not necessarily can't have, but what you're restricted to. Um, so normally, when I am engaged for a job, um, it's by you know, the chef or the owner in conjunction with the chef. And we have some examples of, you know, existing work, whether it's mine or whether it's somewhere else in the world. And we discuss what the menu is going to look like, what the kind of capacity of that thing is. And I guess, you know, the, the other point is what they want to look at if they're going to be looking at it. And um, I normally have to collaborate with uh, mechanical engineers, architects, sometimes structural engineers to develop those solutions and make sure that the end product is something that will, first of all, deliver what it needs to, but will also last um, because that's a big problem in this field or with any, you know, equipment for chefs is they get a, a pretty decent pummeling every service. So they have to be able to stand up to that, um, which is kind of where I found a bit of a niche is um, designing those solutions to be a bit more durable um, than, than what the traditional kind of, um, yeah, what the traditional example would be. Wow. I would just would have thought like a brick oven just would be by its nature durable, but that's really like, what are the sort of weak points in an oven that chefs will tend to trash? Uh, <laughs> there's probably going to be a lot of people listening who are like, oh, here we go. Cause this, <laughs> and <that's laughs> this is what you say to them. <laughs> <laughs> spiraled out of control. Um, uh, but <laughs> The, the main thing um, is impact and, and thermal shock. And those two things are basically, you know, the oven's hot. You don't want to have your arm in there for too long. So you throw the log um, uh, or yeet it as I've recently been been <laughs> labeling the, the action. And then, um, you know, heating or cooling too quickly. They're kind of the two things in conjunction with like what the materials are that um, can cause, you know, premature damage and, you know, in very, very rare circumstances, you know, catastrophic collapses and and all that kind of thing. But for the most part, like a, an oven that's built poorly will still stand up for a while, but it, if you treat it poorly, it's not going to live very long. So, so uh, Samuel, let's talk about ovens of yours through the ages. What are some of the projects that sort of tell your story? 
Uh, well, I, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> the, the thing that I normally joke about is that like I do the jobs that, or I did the jobs for a long time that no one really wanted to, to do or that the try and fix the problems that people hadn't really considered being, um, you know, with a solution. So I guess from an early stage, um, working with Dave at Embla has always been, um, fun and challenging. Like back in the days of uh, Lisa, they they wanted a, an open half, but they also have a building that's completely timber framed. So we had to design something that was um, light enough to carry up wooden stairs and set up, um, but also strong enough that it could have, you know, 400 degrees pass through it every night. Um, and, you know, and then down the track, yeah, you know, Embla being Embla, there's not a long period of time that they're closed. So we had to do a from I think it was Boxing Day or the 27th to the 5th of January, a complete teardown, redesign and rebuild of what their ex, you know existing oven was, which I didn't build, and um, that all had to be done from the top of the oven because it's in a steel frame. Um, so, you know, I rocked up the day after their Christmas party, there were still embers in the oven and, um, I'm sure Dave doesn't mind me throwing him under the bus on this one. I did ask for them to be removed, <laughs> but you know, so I did for the first three hours, it was me with a big pair of welding gloves carrying these like 150 degree pieces of cast paneling through the, the restaurant while it was closed and all wrapped up. And, and then, um, yeah, just jumped straight back in, redesigned a new oven, built it and had enough time for them to do the cu- you know, curing and, um, and reopen with a brand new oven. So it's those kind of jobs that I think I've gained the, <laughs> the, the reputation for being like, oh, you know, if someone's going to work over the Christmas period, it's probably going to be, you know, me. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I guess yeah, the, the other jobs, you know, working, I've worked with Lennox just doing some kind of risk mitigation work at Fyodor. I haven't built that kitchen, um, but that's kind of given me a lot of uh, motivation to look at some of those common problems that restaurants have um, when they either retrofit or have an existing wood fired setup. And, and um, yeah, I think that's in short, not in short, but, you know, in summary, what my, my forte is, is designing solutions for existing problems. Yeah, well, I mean, for the most part, restaurants are in existing spaces and, yeah, often retrofitted. Um, it must be really challenging, like an endless puzzle that you encounter. Yeah, yeah. I, um, someone asked me the other day, you know, you you put a lot of effort into how something looks, like how does it feel when people just set it on fire? And it was <laughs> kind of this very poetic, like, oh, yeah, you know, you can put all this effort into making something pretty and tough but at the end of the day they're just going to set it on fire and um yeah i think the the, the main problems or the main like issues are uh, just you know that they're, they're what you would expect in a restaurant just something has to be able to be practical and functional and and efficient um and uh yeah for for most kitchens um that that have been around for a while. Um, the the main problems that most yeah most ovens or grills have is that they they're not really efficient. They don't you know have a good kind of um, workflow or they don't promote shorter movements. Um, so yeah, that's kind of really where it's steering towards um, with a lot of wood fired cooking is identifying that the the elements of traditional cooking or design that are great but not suited to, you know, being able to knock out 200 covers in a night. (laughs) So, yeah. You know, we can probably all agree on the romance of wood-fired cooking and the amazing flavours, but I do query the sustainability of it. I know, like, you know, recently with all the floods that we had around the country, I think I I was at a restaurant in Adelaide that cooks with wood and they were having trouble sourcing enough timber. And you just sort of think... With climate change, like should we be cooking on wood and is it becoming less feasible anyway? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I definitely agree with you there. 
Um, and once again, there's probably plenty of people who roll their eyes and be like, you can't have an opinion about sustainability when you design equipment that burns trees. But I think um, from a from a standpoint of, of efficiency and uh, I guess the, the energy that you can generate with wood-fired cooking isn't all about heat. It's kind of about seasoning and flavor and process and there are a lot of chefs out there who, you know, will use a fraction of the amount of fuel um, that another restaurant will, and they'll pass the same amount of, of menu items over that, you know, that section or that oven or whatever else. But they're, they're doing it very thoughtfully. And, you know, what is coming out the other end of the, the uh, you know, extraction or being exhausted into the atmosphere is really nothing uh, in comparison to, in a lot of cases, the embodied energy of having these appliances that burn gas or having these, you know, um, your cook lines that have a very short lifespan and at the end of their life, they go straight back into landfill. Um, and, and again, I'm not justifying that every kitchen should have wood-fired cooking and, and you know, I'm busy enough as it is, but I think the the future of wood fire cooking is going to look a whole lot less like what we know as the as you said, romantic, um, you know, provincial style of having these infernos going because that's that's really again bringing it back to that gathering a community. You know, it's not an every night thing. Traditionally, it would be festivals, it would be you know, parties or weddings. Um, and you know, you have to be thoughtful about every single log or, you know, brick of charcoal or whatever else you're putting over that, you know, system because you're putting it back into the atmosphere. Um, and regardless of whether you're growing that, that firewood sustainably or whether you're, you're sourcing it, um, there definitely is a threshold that you can cross where it's not really, it doesn't have a, a, a future, um, that, um, that looks the same as the way that the rest of, of restaurant kind of mentality is going, which is limiting waste and, and reusing as, as much of that energy or being sustainably minded. So um, that's a very long answer to that question, but it's uh, obviously we could just spend a whole podcast talking about that and what the future of it looks like. But I am very hopeful, particularly in the last two years, um, seeing how people have changed their attitudes to um, using um, solid solid fuels as a as a cooking method, so um, I don't know if that answered the question, but I, I don't want to keep ranting. <laughs> well, it, there's so much to say about it because I guess you you know you talk about it versus gas, but then if you start talking about it versus induction that's sourced from green energy, then that's a different equation again. Um, and I yeah, I think as you say, like anything that's done with thought and care and I suppose with purpose is really the point, isn't it? That you're not just cooking over wood for the sake of, you know, getting something to X degrees. It's like you're cooking over wood because as you say, it's like it's it's there's a seasoning to it. There's flavour profiles that you're aiming to achieve. It's it's done with intention. Uh yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. What about the simple practicalities of sourcing the fuel? Yeah, once once again, we could we could spend a whole hour talking about that, and I I have been kind of, you know, collating information and and little sources and things to to put together a bit of a guide for restaurants, um, in terms of sourcing those fuels and and you know who is actually doing their due diligence for um for being as as you know sustainable as possible because a lot of a lot of firewood that people burn you know iron bark red gum, you know, yellow box, it's pretty slow growing timber. And at the rate that restaurants are installing some of these, these, you know, kitchens, um, we're definitely going to have to find a, another source that's, you know, going to be around in 15, 20 years. And there, there is so much, re, you know, research and, you know, um, companies that are going into um, particularly charcoal that's, that's produced by, you know, putting food waste or putting um, timber mill waste through processes where you end up with a product that is, you know, high quality and it's 
you know, I don't want to say it's carbon neutral or carbon negative because that's is a whole different, you know, technicality there. But it's a whole lot more sustainable um, than what we are currently kind of using and 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 what what our mentality is. So, um, yeah, the the electric the electric um, you know all electric movement is definitely one that's here to stay, and we're going to see more and more kitchens switching over to it. But I think if anything. The, the mentality around using charcoal or firewood is going to be something that's smaller. Um, it's not going to be um, these massive, massive kitchens unless it's a restaurant that is dedicating their kind of craft to, yeah, cooking over wood fire. Um, it's really – you must have learnt a lot about – the restaurant trade by engaging with it in the way that you do. You know, you come from a different industry, but you're very much um, embedded in in the in the food world. What have you learnt about the way that restaurants operate? And do you think that they could learn anything from construction in the way that they operate? Uh, yeah, I think um, the the current conversations around it, and obviously with with you know the the climate. The, I guess the um, economic climate that we're in is, you know, what what would hospitality look like if it was as heavily unionised as construction is? And I think at the end of the day, you know, the consumer is not ready for that kind of reform, um, but they need to be, you know, they need to be educated on it. Um, I think, you know, both industries, I would say more so hospitality, are, are progressing at a rate that is, it's stretching and it's hard. And, it, and for me, obviously, um, as you said, being embedded in a, an industry that I'm not, you know, I'm not really trained in. I just, all of my, my friends and networks and clients are all in hospitality. Um, so I guess seeing um, how hard it's been for restaurants, um, you know, we can, we can dial back the clock as, as long as we really want to go, but seeing how they've responded to that and seeing um, how hard it's been to educate the consumer um, has been the hardest thing. And, you know, I'll have a conversation every week about, you know, do you know any chefs? Do you know any, you know, front of house workers who are looking for, you know, full-time work that, you know, will ship them in from another state? And I think being asked those questions as someone who's not hospitality is a good indication that it is a bit of a crisis and the customer is not fully aware that, you know, they're not being um, pushed back um, to a role where it's just a simple transaction. It, it is something that we're going to have to um, respond to in a way that it's, it's together, you know, and construction is its own beast and, you know, they can learn a lot from hospitality. I think that's probably one of the main um, points for me is being in hospitality has kind of made me um, want to distance myself from construction more and more um, because from a culture, you know, there's there's just as many problems there. there there's just more um, support for the individual, I think, and that's not a dig at hospitality. It's just, you know, the, the, the nine hour day or whatever it is started in construction, you know? Um, so I think there's, there's a lot to, to learn from how they do process or contracts or, um, you know, wellbeing. Um, but I, I think at the end of the day, it's the consumer, you know, construction is taking a hit at the moment. Hospitality is taking a hit. Like we're all starting to feel it. Um, but, you know, I think at the end of the day, if more construction workers understood how restaurants work, they'd be better customers. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I think if, um, yeah, hospitality, you know, business owners and, and whatnot understood how trades worked, I think that there'd, there'd be a lot um, more seamless restaurant builds and um, yeah, that's probably all I should say on that, on that topic. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose like broadly what you're saying is, you know, empathy makes for a better world for all of us. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying, Danny. <laughs> but I don't think I'm an authority on that topic. I'm just a guy who builds ovens in restaurants at the end of the day. So, Well, it's interesting. Like, I'm just a journalist who writes about food. and But I feel like you and I can sort of, we're sort of in this inside-outside um, position where you can, you can see things 
I don't, I don't want to, I'm going to say both sides. I don't, I don't really <clears throat> think it's adversarial in the, in the, in the way that those words suggest, but um, it is a really interesting position to be in where, um, as you say, you know, you can feel the pain when someone's talking to you about staff or probably about costs or, you know, um, just really demoralise when they realise that that flu is going to cost X thousand dollars or whatever it might be. Um, you really f- can feel that that pain. But at the same time, yeah, you know, the realities of whatever, you know, whatever it is, like making that hole in the wall or whatever you need to do. Um, so, yeah, I suppose. Yeah. What is it? It's just like about continually being open to learning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, but, you know, we, we can talk about empathy and having an open mind, but I guess we're all in like a bit of a self-protection mode um, in, in a sense. And, you know, I, I'm sure that you are well and truly tired of like referencing the times that we've just been through. But coming out of the pandemic, like the, the, the new epidemic, at least for me, and this isn't about my clients, but just generally when I hear stories about customers or I hear stories about people um, looking for work or whatever else. There's there's a bit of a an entitlement complex that is kind of this undertone where we we feel as consumers maybe more so that we have you know gone through a hard time. So what what we deserve and what we want from uh, service or product or experience is more important because of what we've suffered. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's a collective suffering. Like we're all at a baseline level of we've had a terrible time. Um, (laughs) And I think that empathy and and being able to stop and step back and look at the situation and go, right, well, we've all been through it, but like how do we actually move forward in a way where we're not um, inward focused, we're still able to look after you know, the customer or, you know, more broadly, like people who are experiencing like real, real struggles right now. And, and you know, I don't want to expand on that from a, a national complex or whatever it is, but I think we can all do better in terms of looking after each other. Um, and I think being able to stop and step back and, and look at our situation and where we are right now and um, what we have um, I think there is more hope than maybe what we are seeing right now. Um, but, um, yeah, that was, that was once again, probably a, a longer answer than I need to give you. <laughs> no, we love, we love long, deep answers. I think that's, that's really, it's really perfect. Um, Samuel, I'd love you to finish by just giving us a few, uh, dishes around the country that, have been made in your ovens that you think we should look out for or things that you've experienced that chefs have made in your ovens that you've really enjoyed? Oh, man. That's a uh, – I wish you told me that one to be prepared for because there's a fair few out there. <laughs> but I reckon um, something that I've found really fascinating um, is how people use – you know, if you, if you consider wood-fired cooking as like starting and finishing a clock – um, as soon as you light a fire, you've got smoke, you've got low temperatures, you've got all of that kind of stuff and you build to, you know, whatever service temperature is. And in a lot of cases, what restaurants are doing with those initial points um, of, of lighting a fire and at the very end where there's that residual heat is what I find the most, you know, inspiring and the most, um, I guess, uh exciting for me because I can design a product that that utilizes those stages because I know it can work in in service temperature so I guess a perfect example would be um uh Charlie uh, Snadden Wilson over at Clover is he'll light his fire and smoke bacon while there's residual heat in his oven and he'll use potatoes to cool his oven to a temperature that is perfect for baking bread and those potatoes will, you know, obviously let the steam come off them, which is steam loading an oven. And you, you, I don't, I'm sure you've tried the bread there. I'm a huge fan of it. I think it's some of the the best bread going around at the moment. But like having that um, start and end of a clock, basically having an oven running 24 hours, and there being a dish 
being prepped or finished in it at particular points working with those temperatures is really inspiring for me. And then, you know, Zach first over at Bar Liberty, the uh, the potato and smoked eel uh, pierogi, because I don't know if anyone's heard, but uh, Zach – Zach has Polish background and he likes to <laughs> to delve deep into those cultural roots and I think it's fantastic. But that pierogi is unreal and um, the, the little grill that he cooks a lot of that stuff on is probably the hardest working grill. I, I'm going to probably make the call that it's probably the hardest working grill in the country. It's, it's a little beast, that one. Um, but yeah. Yeah, there's plenty in other states, but I think just the first two that pop into mind are those are those two particular dishes. So, yeah, I love it. And Samuel, are the rumors true? Have you cooked a Basque cheesecake in a wood oven? <laughs> <laughs> well, Danny, you get the tag every time I do it, and it's your recipe. So yes, the rumors are true. It's a great recipe. Um, the the sad thing is, my my wife can't have dairy, so. The, the the sadder rumor is most of the time I am consuming that cake over the course of a week and um, it's a it's a sometimes occasion I think for for me is a, but it's a great recipe thank you for putting that one up um, ah well thanks for taking it to the next level it got me through some tough times in in lockdown I'll be <laughs> honest <laughs> I'm glad to hear it and uh, even though it's a sometimes food for a sometimes week uh, they sound like very good weeks indeed to slowly make your way through one of those by yourself. Um, love it, Samuel. It's uh, yeah, it's been so great to chat to you and um, get a really different uh, angle on this world that we love um, and cherish. So thank you so much for sharing the Brick Chef story with us today. Thank you for having me, Danny. And um, yeah, I'll uh, I'll see you around. I hope you survive the remainder of this uh, Melbourne Food and Wine Festival. Good luck to both of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you.